Hello, my name is Lisa Elvin Speltore, and this is my channel, Have Roots Will Travel. I'm a genealogist and a passionate traveler. These videos and this video series is about traveling through time, and we've been exploring the Fijoa. Today's Fijoa is named Catherine Jura, and we will get to know her in a little bit. But before we do that, make sure you subscribe if this is a channel or a subject that you are interested in, and click on the little notification so you get an alert every time I post new videos, which is about every week or so, every Tuesday I'm trying to do that. So without further ado, let's explore this special program. The Fijiwa program began in 1663 with the Intendant Jean Talon and was a program that was approximately a decade in the making. I want to refer you to a video that I produced called Nifi Jawa, The Program, and it is um, on my YouTube channel. Please go to that if you want more information about the program and how it worked and how the girls were recruited. All of that is in that um, video. We are now going to be looking at Catherine Jura, a very, very interesting um, Jura for many reasons, as we will get to know. She is not actually one of my um, great grandmothers. She's actually a request from a viewer, and I was thrilled to be able to, um, you know, fulfill this request. If you ever want to um, do, have me do one of yours. You know, I'll eventually do them all, I think. But if you want me to do one of yours, please comment in the in the um, in the section where you can, and let me know which one you'd like me to work on. All right, let's talk about Catherine John. Catherine was born around 1639, and she was born in Paris, France, in the parish of saint Eustache. The church that you see um, on this slide is actually the church where she would have been baptized. Um, it is the parish of saint Eustache, the church. Um, it is, you know, the second largest in Paris, and it was built between uh, 1532 and 1632, so it really is her parish uh, church, which is just amazing to me. Uh, the 20, just to show you the size of it, the 2019 Easter Mass at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris was relocated to Saint Eustache um, due to the fire. Uh, that they, they had in 2018 or 2019. Um, so it is that large. So it really, really is on a par with Notre Dame. So you can see the first I'll just smell how central it is. Um, it is, um, you know, it's one in which the um, Le Al, the district of Le Al, which dates back from the beginning of the Middle uh, Ages, is found. Uh, it's just a remarkable, you can really see that she was born in the center of it all. Now, she, after her father's death, she did come to Canada at age 16 uh, on Le Saint Jean Baptiste de Dieppe, and it was on the 18th of June, 1665, that she disembarked at Quebec City. Let's have a look at the groom that she selected and who selected her. His name was Pierre Pichy de la Musette. His parents were Pierre Pichy and Anne Pinot, and he was born on the 18th of August, 1632, in the town of Fay, la uh, in the arrondissement of Chinon, in the department of Indre et Noir, and in the region of Centre Val de Loire, which is a, the central centre region. Um, one of these days, I'm going to do a video on all of the departments and the regions of France. I think it would be like so amazing to discover all the ins and outs of that, and I am certainly learning a great deal in research, researching each of these Fijoa. Now, he arrived in Canada approximately 1662, and he had every, he was married, and he had every intention of, you know, making enough money and then bringing his wife to Canada, to New France. Um, and 
About three months after he arrived, unfortunately, he received a letter from his brother, Louis, telling him that Marie had died. So there he is in a new country. The whole reason for his livelihood, the whole reason for his trip, had been to build a life with this woman, and now she's passed on. So he decides to stick it out. Now, by uh, 1665, a couple of years later, he, you know, is ready, has built up enough money, and he marries Catherine Turpin. They were born, they were married at the Notre Dame Church in Quebec City on the 25th of November, 1665. Now, Catherine and ben Pierre begin to build their family. From all accounts, everything was going wonderfully. So they had Jean Baptiste and Marie Madeleine and Adrian, okay? Until we get word of something. Pierre was informed by someone from his hometown that indeed Marie, his first wife, was still alive. As you can imagine, Pierre was distraught about this. He was not a bigamist. He enlisted the aid of Bishop Laval, of all people, to determine what he should do. Bishop Laval was set to sail for France, and uh, upon his return, he confirmed that, yes, indeed, Marie was still alive. Pierre then returned to France to find Marie, and once she was found, they headed back to New France aboard the ship La Nouvelle France. Unbelievably, Marie would die aboard that ship. Pierre was now a widower again by the same woman. And they say soap operas aren't real life. This was amazing. So, Pierre and Catherine were given the approval to continue their marriage. However, since the first three children were not legitimate, this could not have, this could have been a problem. Thankfully, the Superior Court Council restored the rights of the first of the three children um, two days after the marriage was validated. So we have that. It's just tremendous. I just want to pause and give, you know, kudos to Pierre for doing the right thing, for going back, trying to find the first wife, doing all of that. He did everything right. And um, I, I'm just really proud of that. Now, the family expands and we have Pierre and we have Catherine and we have Francois and we have Ignace and we have Louis. Okay, let's review each of them. And so we have eight children in all. Jean, um, Jean Baptiste, which is the first one, remember I will, uh, the first three children. There we go. Jean Baptiste married Marie Anne Dunbuck and had six children, at least four of whom made it to adulthood. And now we have Adrian, uh, their second son, married Elizabeth Lemony, and had four children, all of whom made it to adulthood. Their third child and first daughter, Madeline, passed away at 11 years of age. Now we get to the second part of the family. Pierre, on their fourth child, married Anne Sylvester de Champagne and had eight children, seven of whom made it to adulthood. This is my friend's um, seven times great-grandfather's line. And I don't know the line of the viewer, but I was able to connect this tree to one of my best friends um, and kind of explore her tree. Their fifth child and second daughter, Catherine, married Antoine Boldero, and they had 16 children, uh, 10 of whom made it to adulthood. Their sixth child, Francois, drowned at the age of 24 and did not have any descendants. Their seventh child, Ignace Joseph, married Marie-Anne Emery dit Codin, and they had 10 children, nine of whom made it to adulthood. Their eighth and final child, Louis, married Marie-Francois Gélineau, and they had 10 children, six of whom made it to adulthood. So this is a huge family in terms of the numbers. Now, the family settles down twice. Um, in 1701, the family moves away. They, they move to Boucherville, which is one of the first times that we are looking at that particular spot. Uh, it's a very long way away from Quebec City, a three-hour car ride today. 
and in 1701 would have been at least a few days journey. I'm not certain as to why the big move. At first I thought perhaps the scandal would have created this move, but by 1701 it was almost 25 years since the episode. Don't you wish that sometimes um, they just left us a note? <laughs> because I don't know why. Um, Boucherville was founded, just to give you an idea, and some of you will go, you know, travel to Montreal, and Boucherville is a very prominent place. It was founded as a seigneurial parish in 1667 by Pierre Boucher for whom um, the city was later named. Pierre Boucher came from Montagne de Bercy in Normandy, uh, France. After having lived in Quebec City and Three Rivers, um, Boucher moved to the Percy Islands by the southern shore of St. Lawrence River, where he founded Boucherville. The first Catholic church of the village of Boucherville was built in 1670. The church made, made of wood was eventually replaced in 1712 by a building made of brick. It was replaced in 1801 by the current St. Fanny Church. Several families left Boucherville in the 18th century to found the community of St. Julie and St. Bruno. So that's kind of interesting to see that, that transition, if you will. The Ile de Boucherville National Park on the Boucherville Islands is, Quebec, is uh, a Quebec national park and is located in the St. River, um, St. Lawrence River, facing the, the rest of the city. So the picture that I, I show here is actually showing it. Uh, they are uninhabited, but they serve as a natural recreational area for residents and tourists. Now, the family moved again in 1708 to a growing new community in, uh, called saint sulpice It was 28 miles from Boucherville, which doesn't sound like much, but again, in 1708, what was that like? In addition, it was on the other side of the St. Lawrence River, you can see by the circle. Now, let's explore a little bit about saint sulpice From 1680 onwards, French settlers colonized the area, clearing the land for cultivation. At the time, it was part of the saint sulpice um, Signorie that was owned by the Société of saint sulpice In 1640, the Signorie granted a concession to Pierre Chevrier, Baron of Francap, and to um, Jérôme Le Royer. In 1706, the settlement was assigned its first pastor, and in 1715, it had the region's only flour mill in operation. The parish of St. Sulpice was formed in 1722, taking its name from the seigneury um, that it, you know, that it founded it. And I want to draw your attention that many of the Fijois came from the region or the parish of St. Sulpice in Paris. So you, you've heard this name before. So, and many of the names in Quebec actually, you know, are from regions in France and kind of, and in the same way that New England uh, named towns after towns in England, the same thing happened in New France. Pierre Pichet passed away on October 30th at seven in, in 1713 at, in St. Sulpice and is presumably buried in the church cemetery, although I have not been able to confirm this. He was 81 years old, which is a remarkable achievement to have lived that long. I suspect their move to St. Sulpice was probably to live with one of their children. Catherine Durand would go on to live another 19 years, passing away at a remarkable age of 90 as was written in the death record. So this would put her birth year to 1642. Not sure if that's true or not, but no matter what, she lived a nice long life. And what a remarkable life it was. For that this couple went through, it's a remarkable love story uh, that proves that integrity and honesty matter and is rewarded in their case with a strong family and a long and fulfilling life. And I just, I just admire this couple. I think they went through a lot. She stood by him and, um, and you know, they lived on into their golden years. And, and this was truly remarkable. And it meant that their family took them in, most likely, um, and that they, uh, you know, were, were cared for. 
uh, that's usually the mark of um, older people, especially at, during this time, uh, that they would have had a very strong and, and uh, loving family to take care of them. So this is the cemetery at St. Sinclair's where she is buried. So that concludes a remarkable, remarkable number 20 um, video for Les Filles du Roi. And she is by far the most fascinating uh, so far in terms of what she went through. Um, love this story, love the ending as well, that they got to live together for so long and uh, were rewarded, truly rewarded. So with that, I bid you adieu. And we will see you on video number 21. Until then, au revoir.